the eye. You don't have to be perfect on an atomic level to be a perfect mirror. You only have to be perfect at the optical level, which is somewhat larger. So people can make basically perfect mirrors, just highly, highly polished things. A perfect mirror will have the photon reflect off in this exact reflection. If you take the normal to the surface, you wind up with equal angles there. So highly polished surfaces act like this. Um, when you get a, a reflection off of something like the surface of water, it'll behave like this. But most of the surfaces that we look around us do not behave like this. We have uh, a spread of the energy where it comes in and it bounces off to some degree in every direction. No matter which way you look at most surfaces, you see, again, zillions of photons coming in. Some of them go in every direction. They just go in a direction that's biased based on the type of surface that it is. A surface that, uh, one of the easy things that a lot of times is approximated, both in the engineering sciences and in computer graphics, is to assume that the surface reflects perfectly diffusely, or it's a Lambertian surface. And what that means is that no matter which way the light comes in, if it hits it completely edge on, completely straight on, it has an equal probability of going in every direction. And there are some materials that are close to this. If you take something like uh, a block of chalk, white chalk, that behaves almost as a perfect diffuse reflector. If you light it from one position and you look at that, like a little scribed out area on it from any different area around it, it will appear to have about the same amount of energy coming out of it. But there are, uh, most, all surfaces are more complex than that though. Most of them will say, for if you've got light coming in here, there will be more of it coming out around the reflection area and some general amount coming out in all different directions. Uh, but these can actually get quite complicated. And the simplifications that we use in graphics sort of approximate these, but you can measure these with specific tools that go in and take lots of samples from moving the lights around, because it depends. I, unfortunately, this is one of the areas where it does get uh, not so great for computer graphics. It depends both on the incoming direction and the outcoming direction. And those are two angles in each one, so it winds up being a four-dimensional equation to say how uh, light comes in here, how does it come out in some other direction. And in fact, it gets worse than that because very few things do reflect just off of this upper surface. Most of the time, the light will go in, go below the surface, bounce around a little bit, and shoot out some other direction. So if you're saying, well, my photon comes in here, not only do you have to say if you're being really, really accurate, which angle does it come off of, but also how far away from the original point does it come off of? Or if it's a thin surface, how does it come out on the backside? You may have other setups coming there. When you look at like a leaf in the sunshine, you've got a lot of the energy bounces off the shiny top face, but a lot of it diffuses through and comes out on the backside. So these are not, uh, not pleasantly analytically tractable things. They wind up being big tables of data. And uh, one thing that's important to remember is when you see like tables of data that are collected for things don't necessarily capture all of the important characteristics of a surface. Where if you take one of these sensors that you can capture uh, a table of data here, if you did have your perfect mirror reflector, it's almost certainly not going to have the exact sample exactly where you want. Uh, so, but eventually data does win. Just as we increase resolution on things, we'll have higher and higher resolutions for our surface models. Uh, and we'll get closer and closer to reality for what we're simulating. So to go as kind of a, a capsule history of computer graphics rendering then, when computer graphics started off, if you look in the 60s, uh, 60s and early 70s, computer graphics research focused on the hidden line problem. You know, we had, uh, we had line-oriented displays, either true vector displays where, like the old uh, 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 video game, arcade games, like, uh, I'm blanking out now. Yeah, like Asteroids is the best example, uh, that are actually drawn by raster beams moving around where they really are true line displays. There's no raster, there's no edge aliasing, and uh, all the different games like that uh, were what the early in the earliest computer graphic systems were basically like that, where they were vector displays. And once people learned how to draw, figured out all the, the basic projective math to say, all right, I've got my cube here, 
know, I want it to look like that, but when I draw it, I've got that on there. How do we figure out which lines that we're going to erase? <laughs> I, and that was, you know, that occupied research for a while to figure out effective ways to do that uh, without spending at the time the scary divide costs for different things, and you'd have lots of interesting uh, work being going on. But when we eventually got raster displays where we could fill them in, of course, at that point, people filled in the, the surfaces of the cube. They're all grayscale at that time. So you can draw a cube and say, well, this will be the light face, this will be the dark face. But that was neat at the time, but that was not sort of what things look like in reality. So people started taking the steps that they could to, to try and say, what do we need to do to make this more approximate what we see with our eyes? And this has been a path that's been driven probably more than half by sort of ad hoc approaches about just, well, what's, what's reasonably easy for us to do that gets us somewhat closer to it, while there's also been sort of a parallel path of saying, well, what's the physics actually doing? How do we make an actual solution for it? Um, so the earliest things that got added to the shading model for computer graphics was if we assume that there's going to be a light that's at some point, in the beginning, they, it wouldn't even be local. You just say light is coming in from this direction. So we want to be able to say what color or what shade should each individual surface be based on where that light is. So you've got the obvious things that if it's not facing the light, no light hits it and you would draw it black. So the question about things that are directly facing the light, so if you've got light coming in, if you have a surface completely perpendicular to it, you make that your brightest color. If you've got a surface that's completely parallel with it, it gets no light, you make that zero. So you've got some curve that goes between it to say how bright something should be. And it turns out that that's a fairly straightforward bit of math to solve where you have light coming in at a certain angle, you've got the normal to the surface, the amount of light that would strike a little surface there is proportional to the cosine of this angle. And that's actually, that's not an approximation, that's actually a bit of ground truth. Uh, if you've got the light coming in, and you've got something coming in at this angle, a surface that's, let's see. If you count the number of rays that go in on something catching four of them directly, turning it down, only covering two, two spaces there. All that actually works out correct, and this is the basis for a lot of the, uh, a lot of the real calculations for light transport. Not a hack, actually part of real proper physics measuring. So once you've got that basic approach, you go back to your cube, and you get your light coming in, and you've got a brighter face, a brighter face, a darker face, and the faces away from it are completely black. And then most people say, well, we don't usually see things like that. So now we get into the fudging. And you say, well, let's just brighten everything up a little bit. We'll add an ambient term. So you sort of just add this minimum level to everything on the back side. And that helps a little bit. If you've got a cube, then everything looks pretty much great because it's a constant color just on uh, the side that you might not see over there. But if you've got something more complex, everything that's not facing away from the light winds up being the same color. And it's clearly not correct. It's not what you'd like, but it was all that seemed reasonable to do at the time. The next step was to start looking at surfaces that are more than these perfectly diffuse reflectors. If you, make, if you model your cube like this, it looks kind of like it was maybe carved out of chalk. Uh, and it can be a decent representation of that. But very few of the surfaces that we see around us are really that simple. Most things have some kind of a shine or highlight on them. You know, as we look around, you can see reflections and highlights on, on all sorts of things. And the obvious bits of metal and plastic, little things that you might hold in your hand. I can look at all these different shines and reflections on the plastic that I'm holding here. Now, the observation was made that the highlights on most objects that weren't completely mirrors, they tended to be something like a bright hot spot, like if you, had a, if you had your sphere here, you would have a bright hot spot that kind of faded a little bit around there. And just by looking at that and saying, well, you know, what could we do that would be kind of like that? The observation was made that, well, if you take this 
sort of cosine arrangement here, this makes this nice broad fall off. It makes a, um, you know, over the entire surface of the sphere coming from that, it'll fade off to halfway around the light. But if you wanted something that was really tight, uh, the thought was, well, we can just take this value and raise it to a higher power. We can just take this and go, you know, square it, cube it, take it to the, the 20th power, which can be done, you know, effectively mathematically quite cheaply. This has no basis in physical reality at all. This is a completely ad hoc approach, uh, but it worked out okay. And this is what the, uh, you know, the Fong lighting model was about, where you separate it into your diffuse lighting, which is the more or less what color the surface is, and then your specular lighting, which is what the highlights are going to look like. So you had this other value to, to play around with, and that was the, the specular power. And nowadays, I, I regret using that in my terminology, where we have power maps, and nobody understands what those are. They, they relate to the, you know, the specular exponent, what you're going to take something to a power of to, to tighten it. The better terminology that's used more often now is a roughness map, where you have a mapping, and you also do it in logarithmic space rather than linear, but more or less, that's still today what a lot of graphics involves, is you've got a roughness parameter which affects this exponent that you take uh, this extra vector to generate your specular highlights for. And again, it was, uh, it would make, so if you're rendering your cube and you get the, the light at the right angle, like if I'm looking at this here and the light's over here, you know, it hits that, if that's at that right reflection angle, then you'll get a nice bright shade on there. That flat surface will catch the light and it will glint at you. And that would be looked at as a, as a real advance for the rendering. So you've got something that looks diffuse, but when it moves, it, when it moves into the light, it kind of catches a flash of light and fades out. So the facets on these solid shaded models started looking better. Now, what, uh, the next thing that people wanted to do is, OK, we, we've got enough cubes and tetrahedrons and uh, dodecahedrons and whatever. So we want to start making things that, that look more realistic. We need to have a teapot. You know, we need to have a curved surface in some way. So you make some curved surface like this. There was a lot of work in the early days on directly rasterizing curved surfaces, drawing them directly, but all the real-time graphics, almost all of it, has been a matter of turning your curved surfaces into approximations with flat surfaces. So you've got something that is theoretically a curve, a curve but really it's a bunch of facets. So if you apply the, the lighting model there to it, you see all of these facets. It stands out as like, okay, you've just carved this as, you've carved this out with all these flat planes, and it doesn't fool you into thinking that this is this smooth curved object. So the next step in graphics that went on was adding the interpolation across, uh, you know, across the, the vertexes, where instead of calculating a value for a face, you calculate it for a given vertex, for one corner, and then you just average, you interpolate across there so that a point here is going to be some average between three or four of the points that make it up. Uh, and that works surprisingly well. Uh, if you're looking again at a diffuse surface, it works out uh, just about as good as you'd like. There are some minor artifacts called mock bands that you get as you, if it changes too much, but if your tessellation's okay, that works out all right. It works out less well with the specular highlights. And the reason is that uh, your specular highlight, if you've got, uh, it might show up, like if you were supposed to have some hot spot right here in the middle of a surface, if you calculate it at the outside, this is going to be almost zero for the specular, almost zero. And when you interpolate across it, it's going to have nothing. You're just not going to see it. You'll only see a highlight when the specular comes up at the, the very edges. And this is what still to this day sort of the standard OpenGL shading model is. It's gross shading uh, with calculations at the vertexes interpolating the colors or parameters across it. So this model is still with us to this day for a lot of sort of quick uh, stuff that's not visual simulation oriented, if you just write something using lighting with OpenGL, that's the model that you get if you turn on specular highlights. Uh, in graphics where they care more about visual quality, what, what started happening was interpolating not the color across it, but interpolating 
the normal, sort of the curvature across each point, and then applying the lighting model at every pixel. And at the time, this, is, this was like a flagrant use of processing power because we're like, okay, these calculations are expensive. We have to do these distance calculations, dot products, uh, exponential power stuff. And when you just do it at each vertex on your cube, okay, so you've got, you know, you've got a handful of vertexes that you need to calculate. But even on an old school display, you would have hundreds of thousands of pixels. And so if you're drawing that there, going from doing this maybe a few hundred times or a few thousand times to hundreds of thousands of times for a scene was you know, a large use of additional processing power. But it got you the good looking areas where you could have a highlight that, that looked about like it should moving across the surface or sitting on a floor looking stable there as you moved around. Uh, people that have been in following PC graphics for the last couple decades, we've seen games that, uh, you know, that do not have interpolation, the different ways where the lighting would change dramatically. We always had the problem of densely tessellated characters or objects and then very low tessellation on the world. Uh, and the problem that you'd run into with that is that if you're applying one of these interpolation schemes to it, you would have something that you could never have highlights in the middle of a surface, only at the corners. And there were also issues with perspective math and clipping that would mean that it would change as a really big polygon get clipped by the edge of the screen uh, in almost all cases the way people did it. And this was one of the big things that pushed me during the Quake time frame to use light maps for the first time where instead of, I had seen other games that were doing lighting at the vertexes and I didn't think it was, you know, it wasn't good enough. You couldn't get anything resembling a shadow. You had all these swimming artifacts uh, with the lighting and it just didn't give the, you know, what I wanted to see. And while Quake didn't have any specular highlights, it did have uh, these, you had samples every 16 pixels in the light maps that we interpolated across those and that gave us the, you know, the look that was very important for it. Uh, you know, we didn't get to actually, it was only all the way up to Doom 3 where we would start doing per pixel operations uh, like this to, to get the, the much better calculations. So even with this level of graphics at that time uh, where you've just got sort of these fong lighting, simple models, hacks like the, uh, the specular exponent and the ambient term, we started to see some offline things being rendered like some movies, you know, early work, some of the early NASA promotional work that Jim Blinn did were significant in the sort of growth of all of this. And then we finally saw some feature theatrical films with like The Last Starfighter and especially Tron, where you would see, you go back and you look at, at Tron and you have a lot of these sort of grow shaded, uh, solid modeled things on there with your light cycles or recognizers and so on. And they were doing something, they were intelligently picking a battle that could be won at the time. If you said, well, we have to go ahead and render photorealistic humans, we were nowhere close to up to that task. But we could do geometric solid models that looked good enough to show on the big screen. And that was, you know, that was a pretty big breakthrough. And simultaneously with this, there was an alternate approach to the way graphics were being drawn that I, so most of the, gra the early graphics were done with rasterization, where if you've got your, your computer screen and you've got your quad on here, I, you would draw this on a computer by calculating these equations of the lines and then you would usually just kind of walk across building up your rows of pixels. I, the whole process of hidden surface removal is another step on top of this, where if you've got lots of cubes, how do you know which one draws on top of the other one? And this was another thing, if you look back in research from the, the 70s especially, there was tons of work going on on hidden surface removal of these clever different algorithmic ways. Today we just kill it with a depth buffer. We just throw megabytes and megabytes of memory and the problem gets solved much, much easier. But this path of rasterization is still with us today. GPUs don't rasterize in scanline order uh, like this. They, they follow you know, crazy winding paths to maximize memory bandwidth, to fill up tiles, you know, to rasterize them in different pieces. And they rasterize all quads at a time, but it's still essentially a rasterization method where we have shapes and we figure out how to rasterize them. We figure out which pixels they're gonna cover. And then we figure out what we wanna do to them. The alternate scheme, which was also developed in the, the later 70s, is ray tracing, where instead of saying, 
all right, I'm starting with my object. I'm going to take these vertexes, these four vertexes that are in space. I'm going to take my virtual camera, and I'm going to transform them and find out where they are on the screen and then fill them in. Ray tracing goes the other way, where you start off with your camera in space somewhere and your little virtual viewing screen. And through that, you send rays out into your world, and you intersect them with your cube over here. And if it hits that cube first, it knows it didn't hit anything behind that. It's got a surface point there, and it can apply whatever shading model it needs to. The thing that ray tracing gave, I mean, it's radically slower, like hundreds or thousands of times slower than rasterization if you're doing just the most straightforward thing. If you just want to draw that cube, you can draw the same thing with rasterization or ray tracing. It's just going to be a thousand times slower with ray tracing. But it allowed a couple things that were either very difficult or impossible to do properly with rasterization. And the thing that you would always see in ray tracing demos is your shiny reflective spheres. So you've got a little chrome ball and the fact that you could see the world reflected into it and then back into your eye was the thing that ray tracing could do that rasterization couldn't do really worth a damn at all. I mean, you would approximate it with environment maps and different things, but uh, for reflections and for refraction, doing those things properly, ray tracing was, you know, was really the only good solution. But it wasn't practical even for most offline work. There are I, I can remember looking at old research papers of things that are run on DECVAX computers, and they talk about the number of hours to render these really trivial scenes, just you know, a few boxes and uh, maybe a sphere sitting there. And the idea of rendering like, complete worlds with it was, you know, was fantasy at the time. But it did address some of those problems for the first time with reflection and refraction. And it also much more elegantly solved shadows, which all of this stuff talking about surface interactions and the, you know, finding out what you hit with the light, that kind of dodges one of the really hard problems, which is saying that, well, the light, light obviously doesn't reach through things. If you transform something up here and you transform another, another surface down here and the light's up here, this should be in shadow because it's blocked by this. But that turns out to not be a particularly trivial thing to resolve. It's basically the same problem of how you view something from your point of view, but viewed from the light's point of view. And that can mean that, well, if every light in your scene has to do similar, uh, similar rendering process to what your view does, uh, possibly harder because they're omnidirectional lights in many different cases, and it's just a tough problem. And as with so many things, there's a lot of wonderful research in the 70s and 80s going through about how you do shadows effectively with these different analytic solutions. In the end, we had a brief period where stencil volumes were an effective way to do things, but now it's essentially all shadow, vol uh, shadow buffers where we really do take every light, render an image from their scene, and use that to back project onto there to figure things out. But that was one thing that ray tracing had an elegant solution for. Again, if you're already a thousand times slower, who cares if you're another factor of two or three slower? For every point you hit, you go ahead and say, I've got my light up here. I'll trace to the light or to however many lights I've got. And if there's something that blocks it, then that's going to be shadowed and I can take it out. So ray tracing always had this, uh, this much clearer abstraction of what you're doing. It's easy to tell that you're sending out a little uh, array, you hit something, you determine whether you hit all of the other lights or if you bounce or refract into something else. So it's always been easy and clear. It's just had this thousand times slower problem to deal with. So the advances that were being made on graphics uh, kind of after this early age focused on the changes in what you can do with the surfaces as the first obvious thing. And a lot of these were driven by sort of artistic and aesthetic condition uh, concerns where we got, if you pull up a 3D rendering program and you look at their material stuff, there's a whole page full of options, things that you can tweak, knobs you can turn, check boxes you can set. And each of these had some use case where somebody wanted this because it made their image generally look a certain way that they wanted. Very rarely were these things driven by sort of physically correct rendering. Uh, and there was a huge plethora of these things that came out. Every different program had a different set of options. You always had this fallback of you've got your diffuse colors, your specular color, your roughness. This basic Fong shading model has, persists to this day. But now we have a ton of other things that we can, uh, 
we can tag on there, things that are subsurface approxima scattering approximations, Fresnel lighting, uh, different frequency response on, uh, on surfaces. It's like some of the things do have physical basis to them. Uh, like one obvious thing, the Fresnel effect is the effect that as you get more and more glancing to something, the reflection gets stronger and stronger. And you see this, this is what makes water and glass look like water and glass. If you look straight at them, you pretty much see straight through them without a whole lot of reflection. But as you get more and more edge on, even a surface like this, where when I'm looking at this at this angle here, I've got a very, very strong, clear sense of the slightly wavy reflection of that white line there. While if I look at it right here, it's barely visible. So that's a physical effect in reality that you can work through the real physics equations of why this happens, but people again sort of called up the trusty raise a cosine to a power and it sort of looks like what we want when we're dotting a couple vectors together. Uh, so that has, that's something that's based off of plausible physics but generally only roughly approximated. And there are other things like that with uh, like the change in some metals get their metallic look because they slightly change colors as they get towards grazing angles. So again, you can calculate the real physics for that, or you can just sign it, kind of say, well, this color sort of changes to this color at the edges and start interpolating between them. Uh, but lots and lots of good work and lots of, uh, you know, lots of high budget movies and so on were built with these sort of very ad hoc techniques. Uh, but sort of in parallel with this, the other big revolution that was happening was global light transport and global illumination. The, it comes back to that whole hack of the ambient term, this sense that obviously where, okay, if I'm right here, the lights are only directly hitting the outside. The back of my hand has no direct view to any light, but it's still quite bright and clearly illuminated. It's bright because all those lights hit this white whiteboard bounce off of that and wind up lighting my, my hand from the back. And you can see like color changes, like if I move up here where it's mostly covered by the blue marker on there, there'll be blue tints to it. And this, this recognition that so much of what we consider important in the visual field is actually indirect. It's not just a matter of here's the light, here's the surface, what's the reaction? Because we come back to how much of the light gets bounced around. And there's a there's a term called the albedo of a surface, which is what fraction of the light gets reflected versus absorbed. And there's some tricky terminology with this because you can have either the total solar albedo where you talk about how much energy comes off of the sun, and this is used for climate modeling and some remote imaging and things like this where you matter, but, um, uh, but you've also then got the visible albedo, which for rendering is what we care about. And the point is that the, the best reflectors, your chrome sphere that's mirrored or your white piece of chalk or your freshly driven snow, those can reflect 90-ish percent of the light, while your darkest surfaces, your lump of black coal or uh, asphalt in some cases, might only reflect 5%. But when, when you're reflecting 90% of the light, what that means is that if you're in a room that has uh, mostly white surfaces, a single bit of light coming out of your light emitter might bounce around a dozen times before it finally gets absorbed. So it could take a very complex path before it winds up getting to your eye. And this is why we could have cases like a, uh, a dark room illuminated only through the crack under the door, but you can still wind up looking around, even around corners. You can go into the closet in the dark room illuminated under the keyhole and still find things somewhat lit. And that's because of this many bouncing path that light can take from the light emitter coming around till it actually gets to your eye. And this turns out to be a really frighteningly uh, complex and expensive problem to solve uh, properly. The first sets of attempts at this uh, dealt with radiosity approaches. And a lot of this was driven by uh, engineering things beyond just making pictures, because you would talk about things like heat management. If you have a certain amount of energy coming in here, how hot is something going to get, and what's the hottest part going to be, because that matters for a lot of engineering terms. So you can do things like you know, make, a, uh, make a complex surface here and say, energy is coming in here. How much of this energy makes its way to here, to here, to here, to here, 
And it's not just a matter of what, that's basic geometry calculations to say how much of this is directly impinging on that surface. What gets complicated then is you say, well, this reflects 50% of its light. And that 50% goes to all of these different ones here. And this one reflects 50%, and that goes to all the ones here. And you know, in theory, you go, if you're doing everything floating point math, you can keep saying you can bounce it 100 times and say you get, well, 